Hello everyone and welcome to Biohackers Lab. I'm your host, Gary Cohen, and on today's episode I have Dr. Tro Collegian. Dr. Tro is a board-certified internal medicine physician practicing in the state of New York. His therapeutic focus includes metabolic syndrome, diabetes, obesity, and medical weight loss. Tro, thanks so much for coming onto the show, and for anyone watching the YouTube video, uh, can you just explain why you're shirtless? Yeah, uh, so, so I'm at so I'm at a pool club today. My wife gave me a, a very nice, uh, uh, you know, ultimatum that I had to come or I'm going to be in a doghouse. So I'm with my family at the pool club, but I, I didn't want to miss this opportunity to be on your podcast. So here I am in my car, shirtless, <laughs> doing a podcast with you. Well, I'm, I'm so glad I could get you on because your story is inspiring. And I'm sure also being shirtless, you're going to show people how you much your body can change and it's, it's a great story for anyone listening to this and it really is about how you you went from being obese until the and into this fit state that you are now and so my goal is today is to help people understand how to start um, that weight loss journey and sort of the tips and, and the findings that you've discovered on your on your personal journey with that so if we could start off what kind of weight did you get to what was your heaviest yeah, so my heaviest weight was about three years ago. It was uh, just on, about 345 pounds. Uh, my weight loss story really starts at you know, childhood. I come from an obese uh, family, and I had an obese childhood. Um, so the, the really story starts then. Okay. And is that what you think started sort of the weight gain issue for you then? Because already as a kid you were... Um, a big kid and it just progressed into your adulthood yeah yeah i think um in terms of be, i'm definitely uh you know there's a big long family history of diabetes and hypertension uh and hyperlipidemia in my family and, and extended family um and obesity uh, amongst other things so i think that Whatever the the whether it's genetics and lifestyle or lifestyle alone, uh, I, I was kind of born into this, and um, you know I wasn't I wasn't always overweight. I ended up uh, in my teenage years. I I went on a crazy kind of fast uh, fasting slash vegetarian slash vegan diet for about a year, and I and I had lost about forty pounds at the time. Um, but sure enough, kind of after high school, that weight crept back on, you know, uh, right away. Um, and then I gained 10 pounds, 10 to 15 pounds a year since the age of 20. Um, and ultimately, you know, I found myself at, you know, uh, more than 30 years of age. My wife was pregnant with her, with our third kid. And, um, you know, she, she posed the question to me you know, are you going to be able to play with our kids and are you going to be around for, you know, to watch them grow older? And that was a very, and, and she did it in a completely safe way, supportive way. She posed that question. And um, that really kind of uh, was a catalyst for me in terms of trying to figure out what to do next. Um, so that you was know, your tipping point, was other, it? Yeah, I think, I think that and... Uh, you know, my I had um, we had a little reunion with my with my brothers right around the same time, and they're all overweight. Well, actually, they were all overweight. One of them has since lost, you know, a hundred pounds. Um, but at the time, we were all overweight, and um, I remember flying to go see my brothers and and to go to this little reunion, and you know, sitting on that airplane. This was kind of days after my wife had talked to me. You know, I had to, I couldn't fit in the seatbelt. You know, the seatbelt on the airplane wouldn't fit. And I had to ask for an extender. Um, and I, I had intense shame from that, actually. And I think I had felt intense shame kind of throughout my life, but my ego was sufficiently built up to protect me really from, from that. I mean, if you've been obese for a long time, you've heard it all. So, you either have to be numb to it or, you know, develop an ego to protect your, you know, your sensitivities from that. 
But for some reason, you know, asking for the seat belt extender and not fitting in the seat was, and then, you know, somehow between my wife kind of catalyzing my thought process and me letting myself feel that shame, it, that was a powerful motivator for me, believe it or not. So, you know, that lowering that ego, letting myself feel shame, you know, was a, was a powerful catalyst in the beginning, I'd say. Mm. Um, I don't know if, if I'm expressing this clearly. It's a tough kind of uh, emotional thought process to convey, but um, I, I don't know. Is that clear? Do you think that's... Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. You know, everyone's going to go through their own journey, their own reasons. And, you know, I think probably a lot of people would, would say that um, a part of the problem of why someone might be overweight or even underweight, you know, it's there's an emotional connection there too. And so, like what you're saying here, that for you, the, the thing that helped you to consider oh I'm, I'm actually there's a problem here was that that shame issue of the extender belt um but i'm guessing were there sort of any sort of um, emotional um stresses in your life that you think contributed to you gaining weight too would would was there sort of like a stress of managing a practice or um, bringing up a family or anything like that that you think also just compounded the situation um uh, well, absolutely. I think stress. I think stress played a role, but I'll tell you how I also think it's it's completely uh, irrelevant. I absolutely had a stressful life. These years were, you know, I was studying for the MCAT. I was taking the, you know, uh, taking the MCAT, then going to med school, then you know, getting married, then having kids, going to residency, starting as a new attending, and after starting as a new attending, managing a practice and kind of, you know, switching careers. Um, so incredible amount of stress and, and the stress level is still high, but not, not as high. Um, so there's definitely was chronic stress and there still is chronic stress. I mean, I, I don't think there's a day that goes by that I get a good night's sleep, um, with three kids, but, but, um, you know, it's interesting when people would ask me, you know, being a physician, I have a lot of colleagues uh, you know, various other doctors that have mentored me, they would ask me, well, you know, why are you obese? Are you, you know, are you depressed? You know, are you, are you stressed eating? And, and I would be asked this and, you know, it came to a point where I was so helpless that I, I'm, I'm the most extroverted guy you can, you can get, you know, I am like loud mouth. Uh, you know, I, I say what I think and I think what I say. And so, I, I don't remember ever being depressed in my whole life or thinking that I'm depressed. Um, but I was so helpless. I, w I was considering, you know, am I depressed and I don't know it? You know, am I stressed and I don't know it? Is that the reason for my obesity? I mean, I was so lost as to why I was obese that I was a happy-go-lucky, extroverted guy considering I was depressed. And this is me as a physician, board certified in internal medicine, you know, uh, knowing that my PHQ-9, which is the, you know, the screening test for depression was perfectly fine, still asking myself, is there some emotional reason for my obesity? Um, so I really relate to patients that I help now who are just as lost and, and, and who, who are bewildered why they're overweight. They, they don't know. And, and I didn't know. And this is despite all of my training, um, I didn't know. And to be honest, the answer is I was obese because I was hungry. That's the God's honest truth. I was obese because I was hungry. And there was a lot of reasons, I think, why I, you know, I was always hungry. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that definitely does. And I think that's a great tip that you've already said there where there's going to be a lot of people who are struggling with their weight management and you know, they're going to have friends or peers that are saying to them, oh, you must be stressed or depressed, as you said that you experienced. And the person with the weight issue is going, no, I actually am pretty happy. I don't, you know, I'm, I don't understand. It's just the, as you said, that gray area of I don't know why I'm so heavy. Um, but now that leads into where you said Do you think one of the key components was this hunger issue that you were dealing with. Yeah, so so the first thing I did um, 
was, you know, I approached my problem through uh, the scope of evidence-based medicine. I'm, I'm, um, I'm a, you know, as I said, I'm a board certified internist. Um, and I was taught in the Yale system with very high regards for evidence-based medicine. So I went to the evidence and I, I literally read every original article on weight loss, you know, over the last 20 to 25 years, uh, including all the seminal trials, invest, you know, interventional trials. I even, you know, delved into the epidemiologic studies. So I went there and, and what I found was a very clear trend that uh, low carb uh, diets seem to, in an ad lib setting, um, and of course, I don't live on a metabolic board. So in an ad lib setting, they seem to favor low carb diets, these weight loss studies. So that's really where I started. And I, I knew that a loaf, you know, a vegetarian or a plant based diet wouldn't be right for me because I had failed that already. You know, I had done that in my kind of uh, high school years. I had lost weight, but then just regained it. I wasn't able to maintain that lifestyle. So I went kind of uh, where the evidence pointed me and, and uh, you know, kind of mixed that with a personal decision based on what has worked for me in the past. So, and then, um, you know, that, that really started things off. It was a complete learning journey after that, reading up on ketogenic diets, um, you know, and, and just going through um, thousands of, of research articles to get to the truth. And, and the truth is that satiety governs uh, weight loss and hunger and appetite govern weight loss and weight gain. And if you can control satiety and control appetite and control hunger, um, you can, you know, gain and lose weight at will. So really the last three years where I've experienced intense weight loss has been very effortless. And I want to say very easy. Um, because when you study satiety and how to how to decrease desire for hyperpalatable foods, you know it becomes like a very easy formula to do. And once you're there, you know this has been the easiest weight loss I've had, and, and now I've maintained it. I keep losing weight, and it's now three years out. Mm. Um, so, so that's kind of how that process started. Um, and and so you you found then that starting off with a low carbohydrate type diet it gave you that that feeling of it's fulfilling your hunger at the time because i mean your hunger levels when you were weighing 300 something pounds is must be so different to your hunger levels maybe now I'm, i don't know if it, if it feels different um but yeah so you found oh well i might as well just start with this low carbohydrate diet anyway and see how i go um did you i mean what what was it like because is i'm just i'm trying to understand too is it the amount of food that you would co be consuming would you were you um did you find that that changed too on the low carbohydrate diet um just from a, an amount point of view yeah yeah so let me let me give you some some tidbits about where i was and where i am um where i was before so leading up to the weeks of me you know kind of going into this uh data hunt and and really researching weight loss um, my wife would hide boxes of ice cream because I'd be able to kill a whole box of ice cream without, without even being full at all. So, you know, that's over like a thousand calories of ice cream and still being hungry. Um, my, you know, I would be able, a box of cereal wouldn't last, you know, wouldn't last at all. Um, uh, you know, so, you know, cookies, you know, these things, they, they wouldn't, you know, these, these had absolutely no, impact on whether I was hungry or not. You know, I could very easily eat four slices of pizza and not feel a thing. Um, and so let me give you a little story about it. about months in into the, this low carb diet. So now, you know, I look at the data, you know, what are the kind of macronutrients or micronutrients that promote satiety? It's protein, namely, and, and fiber. Okay, so I, I start there, you know, and I look into the literature more and uh, low carb hydrate, low carb diets have uh, the highest decrease in ad lib intake. So when you put patients on low carbohydrate diets, they voluntarily decrease their input more than any other diet. 
And particularly when it's very low carbohydrate, very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet, patients just voluntarily stop eating up to a thousand calories a day. And so this uh, intensely interested me, and, and that's where I started my my journey. Starting with originally with a kind of a low carb, fifty to one hundred grams per day, and not otherwise restricted diet. I mean, I ate kind of uh, uh, the only restriction was five hundred to you know. I'm, I'm sorry, 50 to 100 grams of carbohydrates. And then, um, and then, for example, I remember my wife, she made me a bunch of grilled chicken. And I'm sitting there eating grilled chicken. And I remember this so clearly. Uh, two pounds of grilled chicken. I just ate two pounds of grilled chicken. It's probably like 1,500 calories of grilled chicken. And anybody in their right mind, if you eat two pounds of grilled chicken, you are, you are full. I mean, there's no way you can be hungry after two pounds of grilled chicken. And I see my wife dipping it in some honey mustard and dipping it in some ketchup. And I said, you know what? Let me just finish up this last couple of pieces with some honey mustard and ketchup. And I remember putting that, you know, dipping that ketchup, uh, that, that chicken into the ketchup, putting it in my mouth and immediately feeling hungry. And it was as if I didn't eat at all. You know, and then I you know, found myself dipping it in honey mustard and, and eating more. And at that moment, I came to a mini realization that, um, that there's definitely some sort of immediate uh, pathway mediated probably by dopamine um, related to, to that, that, that hyperpalatable food, namely sugar. And, and, you know, in this case, it was honey mustard and ketchup. So despite being completely full moments earlier, that ketchup on my tongue sent a signal to my brain and my brain said, you're hungry again. There's nothing in your stomach. Hmm. Um, so, so that was a realization to me that my sense of hunger had nothing to do with my sense of fullness and what was in my stomach. And there was a disconnect. So when I realized that disconnect, I was really able to make some progress. Does that make sense? I don't know if that's clear. Oh, yeah. Let well, me that's... give you another example. Yeah, yeah. I, I, sorry. No, I love that. Let me give you one more Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So another example is, and I've, and I've mentioned this before, you know, I, was, I ate a big tub of Greek, you know, yogurt for dinner one day, and I was completely full. The next day I said, you know, let me put some flavor in it. I put in, I remember, it was some strawberries or something. And I ate that whole tub of Greek yogurt, and I was still hungry. That this is the following day. Normally, I can't even finish that tub, but adding those strawberries, that sweet kind of flavor, you know, into that. So the next day, I said, "Let me experiment and let me try that with Splenda." There's no calories, there's no carbs. Let me see what happens with Splenda. You know, sucralose. And I took that tub, and normally I would be completely full with that tub. I put Splenda in it. I was able to eat two tubs of yogurt by adding Splenda to it. And I was still hungry, no sense of fullness. Whereas if I did not have the sucralose and I did not have strawberries in it, I was completely full. Um, so these kind of observations, paying attention to what's driving my hunger, that really helped me tweak my diet as time went on um, beyond you know a very low carb modality. Um, yeah, I love you know, those fatty foods. Yeah, there's high fatty foods that do the same thing. It's not just, you know, it is mainly sugar, but there are other hyperpalatable foods that do it. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, from what I was hearing, the, that could be another reason when people think, I don't know why I'm, I'm not losing weight, but they're putting a sauce on their protein. And so they, they're trying to eat all this protein thinking that should make me feel full. But as you found, just putting some sauce on your protein actually triggered you back into just wanting to eat more and more and more. So that was that was fascinating. Um, but you said now too that um, you've, there's certain fatty foods that will, you feel that would trigger the same effects where you, you just can't stop. You just feel like, oh, no, I just want to keep on eating. Yeah, and it's not just me. So like I, you know, I, I can tell you I have a hundred patients who will tell you that, you know, they could eat nuts until, you know, you know, from night to morning. Uh, so salted kind of fatty nuts. I've never met a person that could eat, you know, three macadamia nuts. Um, so, you know, I, I think that there's general, um, I think there's the majority of people are triggered by sweet foods, uh, chocolates, cookies, cakes, okay. Ice cream. 
There's a lot of people also that are triggered by salty, fatty foods uh, like nuts. Um, you know, is the kind of greatest example of that. Um, so I think that there's a, and I think there's a bliss point, which is high, sweet, savory, and salty. Um, you know, uh, or you know, like imagine Doritos. I don't, I've never met somebody that could put down a bag of Doritos. Um, you know, and and they engineer these foods really to hit that you know sweet you know sweet savory crunchy you know you know they they call it you know uh, appealing to their best customers, but it's really you know how can we create food addiction and how can we exploit uh, food addicted you know people who have a tendency towards food addiction. Mm. Um, so, for the most part, I think sugar is is a problem. But there are, other, you know, clearly cases of, you know, I have patients that binge eat on pizza. They eat pizza until they, you know, until it hurts, you know, a whole pie or, or so. Um, and, you know, pizza is fat, salt, and carbs. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's food addiction and binge eating per se is restricted to carbohydrates and sugar. I think the majority of the cases are carbohydrates and sugar. But they do extend to salty and savory foods as well. Hmm. Well, I think uh, in my a... case, uh, you know, not not so much, but it's mainly the sweet the sweet foods. Well, I think that's also again great tips here because um, I'm sure anyone listening to this who's struggling with a weight issue can relate to that. Thinking, oh, I don't have a sweet tooth, so it's not that I'm binging on desserts, but the nuts thing. I, I would completely agree. Even myself, once you open a bag of salty nuts um, and they're tasty, you could just power through that bag. It, it, you, it's so hard to sort of put it down. And I, I can even relate to that that feeling of like, no, I just I want to somehow just keep eating more of these. Um, so it seems like is that sort of the the first step then when you're consulting with a patient is helping them realize that there's certain foods that they just sort of lose control with where they could just there's there's like no stop button or do do people with a weight issue know there's certain foods they just have no stop button most people don't know this they don't realize that their appetite has been hijacked they don't realize that their appetite has been you know it is their sense of satiety and fullness is is being preyed upon by the food industry um, you know, I don't, you know, I don't get the sense that anybody's really aware of this. You know, they know that there's a problem. They're not quite sure what it is. Um, uh, so for the large part, and, and, and look at me, I was a physician. I've gone through years of training on, on nutrition, physiology, and, you know, I've had an intense interest in nutrition my entire life coming from a you know family of obesity. Um, and I wasn't able to figure it out. So how is a lay person supposed to figure this out? Uh, so I find that, you know, um, we stigmatize obesity in, this, in, in, in the world, really, in the Western world, as an issue of, of lack of self-discipline. But I think it's more of a um, lack of, of knowledge. You know, if the path is shown to somebody, they will lose weight. I have yet to meet, you know, I have maybe, you know, very few patients who have not had success after being educated and all that takes all it takes is education i think mm. um most most people don't know they just don't know well that's why we're doing the interview today so we can help educate more people on on this on the situation and you know um everyone also learns from others case studies and you're like even in your case study and so it's going to be reassuring to someone who's maybe sitting listening to this interview right now and they're struggling they're over 100 pounds you know 100 pounds overweight and they're just thinking i don't know where to start um so i'm, I'm hoping already the tips that you're sharing it's going to it's going to motivate people to think okay i can start and I'm, i can sort of take control of my situation again because it must be that control factor thinking i don't know even how to control this yeah, so so the way I started was cutting down um, cutting down carbohydrates and trying to eat, you know, real food that's high in protein um, and not being overly concerned with fat. So that's the way I started, um, and you know, I, I had great success in my first year. I lost about eighty pounds. Uh, so what are the foods that promote satiety? Uh, fiber does it just by being, you know, high in volume, uh, and it hits those stress receptors. 
protein does it. Uh, it's, it's a highly satiating, you know, uh, macronutrient. So then there's kind of other things that do it. Um, the reason I have, you know, I've failed to really see somebody put it together well in the literature, why very low carbohydrates are satiating. But I have three or four mechanisms that I think uh, explain it. Um, one of which is, is the glycemia. Uh, if you take a patient, an obese patient, and you give them a little bit of insulin, just a little bit of insulin, and you examine them on fMRI, uh, which is a functional MRI, we kind of see what part of their brains light up. We find that the, the desire for hyperpalatable foods, which is desire for like you know, very tasty foods significantly increases just by causing a tad bit of hypoglycemia. So if you have hyperinsulinemia with a very tad bit of hypoglycemia and you're obese versus being normal weight, you're going to desire hyperpalatable foods more than that normal weight person. Um, and, and this has been demonstrated uh, um, in functional MRIs. So when you improve that glycemia with a low carbohydrate diet, that's one issue that's getting taken care of. That glycemia uh, stabilizing off is is you know decreasing that desire for hypothalamal foods. So that's one. Two is being in a ketogenic state. Being in a ketogenic state uh, is associated with um, increased satiety hormones, CCK, preserved ghrelin. These are all satiety hormones that are preserved. So that's three, and the, the ketosis itself may play important roles um, in kind of uh, um, neuro uh, receptors uh, that are in kind of inhibitory, similar to some of these medications that that uh, are used for binge eating or are used for um, weight loss. You know, like uh, in the United States, uh, it's you know one of them is is uh, topiramate. Um, you know, we use that for binge eating. And it seems like, and, and there's other Medicaid, you know, there's uh, naltrexone, which is actually uh, used in opioid uh, overdoses, but it also works in, in binge eating. So it seems like ketones play, have an inhibitory role uh, directly on the brain. Um, and then the last thing is, is uh, you know, a low carbohydrate diet compared to a low fat diet preserves peptide YY. Which is a, a neuro, you know, kind of a hormone that uh, promotes satiety. So if you take people and you put them in a Chinese buffet and you give them peptide YY, you know, the ones that get peptide YY will eat like 25% less than the ones who who don't get it. And and this has been compared to low fat diets even 12 months out, and low carbohydrate diets have more of these satiety hormones, and ketogenic diets have more of these satiety hormones. So I. You know, after learning this, you know, I'm like, I have to go very low carb. And and then, um, you know, somebody challenged me to go uh, no carb. You know, it was actually uh, Sean Baker who challenged me to go no carb because I, you know, I didn't quite believe in the concept of fat adaption, you know, beyond a, a, a low carbohydrate diet. And, oh, boy, was I wrong and was he right? Um, I went no carb for a month and, um, you know, it, it, it was a miserable month. I like re went through keto flu, you know, which is the symptoms of kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, carbohydrate withdrawal essentially. And I remember coming out of that month and this was about two years ago and incredibly, you know, I was cursing his name because I felt terrible. And, um, and then I remember, you know, my wife, she, she made me like this high fatty, you know, meal, like a, she made some bacon and eggs. And that whole month I had been eating pretty lean meats. And I remember specifically, it was like four weeks in, I eat this massive fatty meal and I have like a burst of energy, like this amazing sense of energy comes over me. And, um, so that was another kind of mini realization that, um, that fat intake that yeah, you cannot lower you cannot just eat protein. You cannot do like a protein sparing modified fast forever. You cannot do a very low carbohydrate, high protein diet forever. At some point, your body is going to want and crave and need a little bit of fat. And um, 
you know, and, and, and there's, there's plenty of data to support this in the literature, uh, this concept of fat adaption. Um, so that was another kind of learning point for me. So this is, yeah, that's interesting to hear. So you were already on a low carb diet and eating that way. And then you challenged yourself with the, the, the Sean Baker carnivore diet. And right. it, it, so what I'm hearing too, is that you found, uh, something that you learned is don't just eat lean meats when you go on an all meat or carnivore diet, that's actually a problem. You, you need, you want to be getting fatty cuts of meat. Well, so I would say if you're, if you have the belief that you're trying to lose weight and you're going to eat, you know, lean cuts of meat, that that's not a good idea. I think you have to, you know, eating a month of grilled chicken is not tenable. Um, you know, you clearly, you can go the opposite route and not overdo the high fatty cuts of meat and, and eat all bacon all day long and then not gain, not lose any weight. So, and you know, Sean Baker eats like four or five pounds of, of ribeyes and, and he's pretty much weight neutral. Um, so I think when I counsel patients who are, you know, eating too few calories or not, or focusing on solely eating lean meats or only eating egg whites, I think that's a problem. But at the same time, I think the other side of the coin is, you know, eating, you know, bake a pound of bacon in a day. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily in line with a with good weight loss strategy over the long term. Um, so I think there's a Goldilocks and it depends on the needs obviously yeah well that's um, a great tip you know, already there i think troy um that you were saying because I'm, I'm sure people will do certain things in extreme it's our natural behavior it's like i'm either just the lean meat kind of person or i'm just i want all the fat kind of person um but as you as you said you know if you have all the all that fat that could cause a problem from a weight loss point of view um and then you've got this the the feeling of satisfaction and energy levels if you're only eating lean meats. Um, so as you said, you've got to find you got to find that sweet spot for your physiology. Yeah, a- absolutely. And um, and I think you know going into the literature, especially for for kind of ketogenic diets for for athletic performance, um, you know this concept of fat adaption is very real. Uh, we see it in marathon runners. We see it in, in um, you know, in CrossFit athletes. Um, and it takes at least, you know, four to six weeks of a very low carbohydrate diet. And uh, I'd say probably up to three months. Um, I know I've been doing a lot of training um, um, and, and kind of uh, making some athletic goals for, you know, meeting some athletic goals for myself. And uh, I can tell you that fat adaption improves over time. Um, that's something I've noticed, you know, res- regardless of, of overall conditioning. Um, in terms of muscle soreness and recovery, um, these, and these are all kind of supported by the literature. You know, gymnasts say that they're not as sore. Uh, you know, CrossFit athletes don't have any decreased performance and increased recovery times. Marathon runners with, you know, improved uh, fat oxidation numbers and ability to run, you know, marathons without, you know, any fuel intake whatsoever. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, Sean kind of got me started on, on, on that. I have to give him credit for that. Uh, kind of really going into that literature and self experimenting. Yeah. And that's what, you know, this whole program is about is N equals one and, uh, that you know, taking a theory and testing on yourself and seeing what the results come back. So, uh, I like the idea with that fat adaptation because another part of the weight loss story is that people will think, oh, no, I need to eat a certain way and then they're going to get told they need to exercise really hard to lose the weight. But I can imagine when you're a 300 plus pound person to try start exercising is an issue in itself, is it? Yeah, so I lost my first, in my first year, I lost 80 pounds. Two or three times a week, I went to the gym and I walked on a treadmill, binge watching Walking Dead. Um, you know, so I, 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 you know, if you consider that exercise, I think I was just creating a habit, knowing that as I lost weight, I would dial up the intensity. So for one year, I mean, I, I didn't, 
minimal exercise. And I lost, you know, 80 pounds or so. And then, you know, as my body felt better, I, I started to increase that exercise. And now, you know, the, my following year and the second year, I really started to dial up the exercise. Um, and I lost another, you know, 40 or 50 pounds. And then in my third year, I lost another 20 pounds. Um, and I'm, you know, I've posted these numbers. I, I'm running, you know, two miles now in less than 12 minutes uh, with a personal best of 1130, you know, and I, I did two miles in about 35 minutes, you know, uh, two and a half years ago. Um, that's a big drop. Yeah. So, so. Yeah. 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 I'm very proud of that. Um, I'm very proud of that. So, um, yeah, I, I don't, when, when my patients, none of them are told to exercise. If they're already exercising, they can keep exercising. Um, but if they, are wildly obese, uh, massively obese, a lot of weight loss that they that they need. You know, the first six to eight weeks, there's literally no exercise recommended. It's not even discussed. When they feel they have more energy and they want to, you know, I tell them that's fine. Go ahead. You can start walking, um, but I don't encourage exercise for the massively obese. It, it's it's a setup for injury. They're not their bodies are not primed for it. Um, after they lose a little bit of weight with the diet and they're comfortable and the satiety's managed, the appetite's managed, the hunger's in check, then I'm very comfortable letting them go at their own pace. And um, I could tell you two-thirds will start exercising on their own and the remaining one-third will exercise with, with encouragement. Hmm. Um, and I love that idea that you said oh, yeah. that, um, <laughs> well, especially with The Walking Dead, I mean, how, how better to watch a, a program about people walking, yeah, zombies walking around than walking on a treadmill yourself. <laughs> I, I could imagine you just want to sort of drag a foot just to pretend a little bit that you're one of the cast members or something. <laughs> um, but it, what you mentioned there, you know, the biggest takeaway I'm getting there is it's, so the the, the exercise thing isn't, massively important in the, in the beginning and it's actually something you don't want to focus yourself on it's just starting to to understand that hunger issue but putting your, getting yourself into a good habit like even just walking is it that's a good thing to practice like actually just put your stop putting yourself in the habit put yourself in those in those situations where maybe you're in a more positive environment because it's a gym or some, or it's a beautiful outdoor setting but it's going to start making you feel good too in that sense and once something becomes a habit you can and it, and you just bite at it slowly it's easier to progress as you're as you're progressing on your journey too i think that's such good good sound advice there yeah look the, the there are you know there are for weight loss Exercise is almost completely useless, and we have data to support this. Um, almost completely useless for overall health, for bone health, for you know body health, for um, you know the, the cardiovascular health. The the benefits of exercise are exponential, and and they're unquestioned. So, if the question is should you exercise, the answer is yes. If the question is should I exercise? To lose weight, it's you don't have to. You have to fix the diet first. If the you know the question is you know can I exercise while I'm dieting? Yes, as long as the appetite is controlled, um, and and the, the the hunger and issues are are resolved. The you know the the point of making a hat you know making a habit. So what did I do that first year? I blocked off, you know, 30 minutes to 45 minutes a couple times a week, and I made it a habit of going somewhere and doing something, okay? And that habit was what I built it off of a year later when my joints weren't, you know, in, you know when I wasn't dying of knee pain and back pain, um, you know, when I was able to move, you know, I was able to leverage that habit uh, and that lifestyle. So... Yes, I 100% believe in the power of creating positive, um, you know, changes to your lifestyle. Exercise is, a, is an important component of changing a lifestyle and improving your lifestyle. Um, making a habit, whether it's walking or, or doing a stationary bike, these are all things you can do. Or just doing, you know, body weight exercises in the home. Um, you know, those are all 
significantly important. But for weight loss in the first couple of months, I don't think it's incredibly relevant or necessary. And they may be even, you know, if the appetite's not controlled and the joints hurt, you know, telling somebody who's 300, 400 pounds to go exercise and eat less is a fruitless endeavor. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, you know, a point you mentioned there actually for me resonated because the re everyone's got different goals and so they might might think <clears throat> initially that yeah i'm going to exercise because it's going to help me burn more fat off but as you said no don't even think about that it, you know think of exercise as this as this really healthy thing that's going to help you with your bone health your muscle health and all these other things but in the spectrum of issues right now if you're morbidly obese that's not we're not bone health is not like through exercise is not what we're trying to address first we actually have to get the hunger get you on that weight loss sort of scenario through the food first and as you're feeling better as you're getting motivated as you're seeing the positive change in your body you're probably going to get inspired to go. I want to. I want to implement this weight, this exercise thing now even more because I want to take care of my bones and my muscles and all these other elements. So I, I like that idea. You know, just to change the, a person's mindset to go. Right now, the scenario you're in, don't even consider that because you know we need to. Do, this is the bigger issue we need to deal with first. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Look, we've been told to eat less, move more, and we've been told it's our fault. Um, we've been told to track calories and, and this is all just complete bullshit. You'll never hear me. So sorry if I'm cursing, uh, but, it's, but it's complete, you know, BS. Um, you know, counting calories as an intervention is wildly unsuccessful in the literature. Um, exercising, eating less and moving more is wildly unsuccessful. Uh, as evidenced by the obesity epidemic we have and the fact that this has been standard advice for 50 years. Um, you know, none of these things are, are helpful or supported by the literature, in my opinion. Um, you know, calorie counting to some extent, there's some evidence that, that it, it has short-term weight loss implications, but no long-term weight loss implications. Um, and I think everybody's looking for kind of long-term solutions. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't tell any of my patients, many of my patients count calories. They send me their MyFitnessPals. I tell exactly none of them to do it. They don't need to track any calories. The first six weeks we spend focusing on hunger and appetite and, and satiety. And I, you know, I love that Tro because uh, I haven't grown up in Africa. Uh, you you sort of in a scenario where you go well imagine you were placed in a in somewhere where you didn't have a cell phone and you didn't have access to like a my fitness power that you could actually track all this stuff you just had to eat what was around you and but yet you could manage your weight that way so it's not this element of because even as a lay person how do i understand this calorie thing and uh yeah, so you just, it's that eating ability just to know like, no, I've had enough today. You know, I'm, I'm good. And some days I eat a bit more, some days I eat a bit less, but actually my weight is generally nice and stable and healthy. So um, I, it, it's that, you know, keep it simple because you can overcomplicate a scenario too. Yeah, people could get lost. You know, look, you know, obesity is not a my fitness pal deficiency. You know, obesity is not a gym deficiency. There's more gyms now than there ever was before. You know, there's more, uh, you know, there's more apps for calorie tracking than there ever was before. These are not the causes of obesity. You know, obesity is, is a very complex multifactorial disease, yes. But at the bottom line, it's, it's, you know, if you're not hungry, you're not going to eat. If an obese, if you take an obese person, myself, and you make them not hungry, they will lose weight. And my patients, uh, pretty much all of them, they get not hungry and they lose weight. Um, and it's as simple as that. And sometimes there's, you know, obviously I'm oversimplifying it. I spend, you know, I'm with my patients 90 minutes for the first visit every week. You know, we're meeting at least for six to eight weeks. So this is a very intense uh, process in the beginning. And, and it's a relearning of, of how to take control of your appetite and your hunger and your satiety. Um, but it's, this is the only way I see viable. I, I don't see any other way to lose, you know, hundreds of pounds by, you know, by exercising or eating less. It's, it's, in fact, I think eating less is harmful. Um, so. 
and as you found that. yeah and as you found you've managed to not only lose all that weight but the key element is keep it off too because you don't yo-yo straight back into a bad place again so <clears throat> i'd be interested to find out where are you at now dietary wise so you mentioned that you were you tried sean baker's carnivore diet are you still on a carnivore diet or are you on a sort of like a modified no, no, one yeah, version yeah. of it where, where are you at now yeah so, um, in the first year, I, it was just a standard low carbohydrate diet. I ate, you know, Greek yogurt and I would have cold cuts, but you know, I really focused on reducing. So where I'm at now, I did that for a month because, you know, I was challenged to do so. And I, and I did it, um, in terms of where I'm at now, I, I eat, uh, vegetables. I eat, you know, uh, berries. I do have nuts. I eat a lot of meat, fish, uh, poultry, uh, seafood. Um, so like I think any given day you'll see that I'll either have steak or salmon or cod or shrimp. Um, I'll eat eggs a couple times a week. I've, I, I have actually decreased my processed food in my processed meat intake. So I, I, I'm not heavy on bacon. Bacon is like a treat. Um, I don't really do any cold cuts anymore. Um, and, and that's how I advise my patients. I advise them for weight loss. I say, we don't need to really care about it. We're worried about protein and we're worried about getting good fats and we're worried about keeping the carbohydrate count low. Um, and I explain to them that in the long run, eating processed meats is probably not ideal. Um, and so that, that's been my approach is that for weight loss, I kind of, uh, turn a blind eye, and then when the weight loss stalls, or or when the weight, you know, the goal weight is achieved, and in my case, my goal weight is achieved, you know, really we want to have an optimal diet, and I, I think, you know, it looks like the evidence leans towards processed meat probably not being incredibly helpful, and that has to be mediated by the the nitrates and the you know the the, the celery powder which has nitrates in it. Um, so my diet is a very low carbohydrate diet uh, with probably 30 to 50 grams of carbohydrate a day. Um, and it does not have a meat or animal product restriction. The only thing I restrict may be like I just limit processed meat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's I'm not, I don't feel strongly about that either. So, but I, but I think the evidence points that way. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm doing. Yeah. Well, again, it's a journey, you know, a journey of discovery as to what your sweet spot is and what you feel best on too. Um, <clears throat> so when you were talking about the, the honey mustard and the ketchup, has that changed yeah. for you? Do you still have that as a trigger? Do you feel even now three years later? 100%. 100%. If I put on, if I, if I have a little bit, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, I could eat, you know, endless strawberries. I could eat endless blueberries, you know. So even those things that I that I eat, I'm I have to be mindful of. For sure sauces will trigger me. Um even hot sauces I find, you know, the salt and the flavor profile can are things that I have to be mindful of. You know, if it's a new food like the other day my wife made like a keto cake for my birthday and it was just incredibly tasty. I mean, it was like almond flour, uh, butter, and, and egg, and cheese, kind of all. And in in, it's like a keto pound cake. And I couldn't stop myself. Um, but, but so now I'm mindful of that. I, you know, this has, you know, it's savory, but it has low carbohydrate. But I know that, you know, when I, when I eat this, that I have to kind of be careful and make sure that I'm, you know, well-fed going into it, um, going into exposing myself to these things. Um, the other thing I've noticed is, you know, seltzers or flavored, you know, flavored seltzers. Like, I don't know if you guys have La Croix and in, in, in where you are, or if you have uh, Ices, which are kind of these tall flavored, you know, seltzers that have like there's a fruit, fruit flavor. They have no calories, but I could easily drink four or five of these. Um, and I, I was talking to my wife about it and she was saying, well, why do you care? They have no calories. And I explained to her that, uh, I'm sorry, is there a big glare? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the sun's coming through. <laughs> yeah, um, that's okay. 
So uh, that's coming off my bald head. <laughs> um, so so the the um, I was explaining to my wife. Well, she's like, "Why do you care if you know it's a flavored seltzer? If you you know has no calories? Well, why does it bother you?" And I explained to her, "It's getting in the habit of letting yourself go with food is not a habit that's that I want in my life." Um, so. She's like, well, what do you care if you have four seltzers or four of these zero calorie ices, these flavored, you know, uh, um, you know, very fruity kind of uh, no calorie diet sodas, basically. And I and I care because I I feel like it creates a bad habit of letting myself go and and you know drinking four of these is not a normal way of uh, a way of uh, eating or drinking, and so. Even though they have no calories and no impact on my glycemia, the idea of um, of of a food triggering me and me letting myself be triggered by it is not one I'm comfortable with um, because I, I feel like it creates a bad habit. So people ask me, you know, can I drink diet soda or or you know flavored you know zero calorie drinks? And I tell them, you know, if you're not triggered by it, go right ahead. You know, and if you are, I mean, it's not ideal to take these artificial sweeteners and colors, in my opinion. But you know, if you're, you're we're human, enjoy it. You know, but if you if you are triggered by it, you should avoid it. You know, it's not not something that that works for you. It's not something you want in your life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's I great. That, yeah, that's yeah. great advice. Again, you know, yeah. it's, so it's it's that. Even once you've once you've got yourself in that better situation, you've <clears throat> and you've educated yourself and you understand your physiology more. You 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 become you as you said you become a more mindful eater, and so you can realize like no, actually I'm in control and I'm not going to just power through this weak food that always gets me every time. As you mentioned, like the ice cream scenario where you just went through all of that, or now the seltzer drinks. Um, so I, I, it must be a night. Especially if you've gone from a place where you've where you've been where you weighed so much, it must be so empowering to go. No, actually, I I I know what what's going on, and I I can I can make a better decision here. Yeah, well, sometimes I can, you know, like like I had four of those icy drinks. You know, when I realized there was a problem, my you know my wife had got a box, and I didn't think anything of it, and then a couple of days later, I see her buying four boxes, and then a week later, there's like you know, six boxes in the house. I'm like, wait a second, what's going on here? She's like, oh, they keep running out. I'm like, oh, wait a second, you know, <laughs> what's going on here, you know? And and that's when I started really paying attention. So I was kind of, I was originally caught off guard. And yeah, you have to be vigilant, you know, you have to kind of pay attention to yourself. And now I very clearly know I've articulated it and thought about it and seen it kind of midway. But you know, in the beginning, I was just like, "Oh, this is sweet. It's got no calories. I don't need to think about it." But, um, but now I've thought about it, and now I know to be careful and, and to kind of think twice. And the same thing with that keto cake. You know, the first time I had it, I was like, "This is great. Give me more." But now I'm, you know, I I have to. You know, I'm mindful of that that it has a little bit of an impact on me, and and. So I, I actually tell people now if they know they're going to like a birthday party or something or a special situation where they're going to be exposed to these foods, I tell them all the time, you know, you have to prepare in advance. So sometimes I tell people eat in advance, you know, eat a highly protein filled, you know, good fat filled meal so that you're walking in and you just have no desire for food. And the way I explained it is, you know, have you ever gone shopping hungry? You know, you end up buying everything, you know, and have you ever gone shopping you know, without, with, with being completely full, like you just ate dinner. It's like you look at things and you just don't want them. So, so use that, you know, psychology or physiology to your advantage. If you know you're going to be in a, you know, difficult situation, um, you know, use that practice to your advantage, you know, eat something, you know, go have a ribeye steak or, you know, go eat some, you know, salmon or, you know, just, you know, take a pound of shrimp and cook it and eat it before you go. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's how I've kind of advised people, and, and that's what I do myself. Well, Tro, you've you've shared such great knowledge bombs, and I mean that last tip again there just is so useful for for people um, 
who aren't who are trying to manage their weights and they go to social events and they don't want to end up binging or you know falling into a bad habit as you said just eat a good meal before you go out as as, as a simple mitigation factor that you could try out so i i love that um so i know i'm mindful you you're <laughs> you're in sunny new york as we can see through the video and you know you've got your family waiting outside there too um <laughs> but i They're just want to yeah. <laughs> so I just want to say thank you so much for coming on and sharing your personal story. I mean, it's it's so inspiring and the amount of information you've already shared just in this bit, I think will be a good amount of information to get people to want to start or know how to start, you know, that first little hurdle. But, you know, as with anything, people might want to go, well, I want a little bit more help. So is there any other way that people could follow you or contact you that you want to share the links? Yeah, so uh, my website is currently being redone, but uh, that you can, it's old, but they can visit it and contact me through that. It's palisadesmd.com, P A L I S A D E S M D.com. Uh, or you can find me on Twitter, my first name and last name, uh, you know, at T R O K A L A Y J I A N. You could just direct message me or message me. Facebook, you know, same, same you know, scenario, just search me on Facebook, you'll find me. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty responsive to all social media. You know, I do um, uh, weight loss consults completely online. So I have a uh, telemedicine software that I use. So I'm, you know, I have patients all throughout the world that I'm doing telemedicine consultations with. And, you know, you can easily set that up, just get in touch with my office or, um, or contact me through social media and we'll set it up. Cool. Well, again, I'll link to all of this in the show notes for everyone. Um, but again, enjoy your afternoon in sunny New York and, and playing with the kids in the pool. And uh, yeah, keep up the good work, man. You're looking very healthy. Thank you for having me. 